Hi, everyone. Welcome. Today you are joining us for the SWEET seminar, which is put on in partnership with the Anna Bacher Society and Source. And we're really thrilled to hear from a few of our very engaged students from the MPH program that have been working in partnership with some of our community-based organizations here in Baltimore City. This is one of the events throughout our week-long celebration of National Volunteer Week. And I was saying to a few folks before we began that this is one of our favorite weeks of the year because it is love fest. All week long, we are just celebrating and, and appreciating all the fantastic work that folks have been doing with community here in Baltimore. And we're just really excited to hear from a couple of our participants um, and have them share a little bit more about their great experiences. I do wanna give a couple of reminders of other upcoming events throughout National Volunteer Week. There's a few things that are going on right now. All of this week and next week, we are doing our final donation drive of the year. So we are collecting toiletries and there are bins um, where we're collecting these items at the entrances at the School of Public Health, in the lobby at the School of Nursing, in the lobby at the School of Medicine. Um, a few more things that are coming up this week. Tomorrow, we have our Source Volunteer Appreciation and Service Award Ceremony. That's a special invitation only event, but we'll be giving out our 21-22 Source Awards. So stay tuned to hear about those winners. They are actually announced live and we'll be sharing more information over social media as well. But tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday, April 27th, at four o'clock, we'll have a poster session for this year's Source Service Scholars. And that is an event that we're hosting hybrid. So we've actually already cut off our in-person opportunities to participate, but you can join us via Zoom as well. And then on Thursday, April 28th at noon, we will have another one of our partner panels. And this partner panel is an opportunity to hear from about four of our partner and community-based organizations who will be talking about bolstering healthy environments in Baltimore. And then on Saturday, we actually have a service project. And we're going to be doing some great work Saturday morning from 9 to 12 that we're going to go to Patterson High School in partnership with one of our organizations, Thread. And we're going to be helping with the school. They have a community clothing closet and a food pantry and some beautification projects that will be underway. It's a great way join in in some of that fantastic community work. I do want to shout out to our team that's helped to put together National Volunteer Week. We've had an event yesterday. Today's event is hearing from our MPH students with the SWEET seminar. So I do want to thank our source team, including Ezad, Katie, Vanessa, Rosemary, Tyler, and Saquon, congratulations. And then today I wanna to particularly thank the team from the Anna Bacher Society. And at this point, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Shireen who's gonna be moderating our session. Thanks to Anna Bacher Society and thank you, Shireen. Thanks so much, Mindy. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Shireen. I'm one of the coordinators for the SWEET Seminar. I'm on the board of ABS. Um, thank you so much for joining again. Um, we're just going to run through um, our speakers who are here. Lauren, Harry, and Annie will be joined by Jack um, in around 10 minutes. Um, if you have any specific questions for our speakers, we can take like one or two after each. Everyone goes through the little spiel. Um, and we'll also have a broader Q&A session at the end. Um, so if any of our speakers would like to go first, you're welcome to go ahead and jump in. Sure, I can get us going here. Uh, Alrighty, my name is Lauren Russell, um, and I am involved with Source as a member of the Student Governing Board and also um, a volunteer with, or one of the co-chairs for ABS for community engagement, um, and then speaking today more about work that I've been doing at the Baltimore YMCA that's over in Druid Hill. Um, so over the past uh, six or seven months at this point, uh, we have been hosting about four uh, tastings or cooking demonstrations each month, uh, really focused on using food pantry items to make recipes. So the YMCA there has a food pantry. Um, it started right around the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it had actually been in the works prior to the pandemic, but then ended up coming to fruition there pretty quickly with the YMCA trying to figure out how to best support community members. Um, so it's a free food pantry for any community members. You don't need to belong to the Y to get uh, access to those resources. Um, and it's sponsored in partnership primarily with uh, McCormick Spices actually gives a lot of uh, gives a lot of donations there and then the Maryland Food Bank. 
Um, and so through that work and partnership with a professor and actually another member of our cohort, we designed recipes um, that, as I mentioned, primarily use those items and then actually go to the Y and in front of all the Y members, you know, make those recipes and then actually serve them as tastings. Um, we sort of collect feedback on site and have made a few modifications as we've gone, um, even during recipe day. So we're there for about four hours each time and it's while the food pantry is open. Um, so that's how we ended up picking our days and times um, in hopes that food pantry recipients themselves can actually taste the food so that if they get this seemingly random, you know, bag or this bag of seemingly random items, they can actually use those when they get home um, so that, you know, it reduces food waste, but also gives them these healthy and nutritious items. Um, so obviously we try to make them with uh, less salt, which is challenging uh, since the professor that I'm working with is a former chef. Uh, so we have to be very thoughtful about our salt intake there. Um, and then also trying to make them with like olive oil instead of butter, for example, um, and sort of trying to minimize any other um, less healthy food options that they may receive. Unfortunately, um, most of the canned goods there are pretty low in sodium, so that's not too much of a concern. Um, but that's something we've been doing for a while and uh, we're actually hoping to transition it over to the YMCA here shortly um, for the Y staff or their volunteers. They have like five to 10 volunteers each time the food pantry is open um, to hand out bags to different community members, um, but so that they can actually keep this up and then potentially in the future even do more robust demonstrations um, where they actually maybe can even auction off, auction off some burners um, or do like a raffle for burners, um, just because we've gotten some feedback that some community members maybe don't have stove tops or access to burners. Um, so of late, we've also been revamping our recipes so that they are totally appliance free, um, which has been a bit of a challenge. Um, just to make sure they're still filling in appliance free, but something that we've been working on. So happy to speak more about that later, but I will pass it off to whomever would like to go next. Don't all jump at once. Uh, I can go. Um, so I've been working with um, P2P, which is prison cells to PhDs, uh, which is a Baltimore based, but like sort of nationally involved organization that does various like education classes and like ready for grad school or college courses, financial aid applications um, with incarcerated current or form formerly incarcerated students. So it was started by Dr. Stan Andres, who if you were in the MPH program, uh, was like an invited speaker for our health policy course over the summer. Uh, he was like a formerly incarcerated person who went and got a PhD in endocrinology and started this organization. So I've been helping with that as a policy intern. So that's been sort of various like Maryland level policies related to um, uh, policies that would impact uh, education opportunities for currently incarcerated students. Me and the other people on the intern, uh, the policy team were responsible for sort of like looking at the policies. Um, trying to analyze what the impact would be, what the organization stance would be, contacting uh, legislators to get more information about it. Uh, and then I also helped with Unlock Higher Education, which is a coalition of different organizations that are involved with education opportunities and education equity and prison, um, uh, like prisoners' rights and education opportunities in prison, sort of like a, a mishmash of different organizations that are all sort of working in the same space. So I've been working with that sort of as the like administrator. So trying to coordinate monthly meetings, run the monthly meetings, like take notes, um, distribute uh, various resources that from like between the different organizations. So that's been my role with it, mainly more like administrative, I suppose. Um, but it's been very cool because it's like a very local organization, but it's also connected to uh, like other grassroots organizations throughout the country. And it has um, like education programs in multiple states. So it has actual, um, you know, like in prison education classes and workshops, not just in Maryland, but across the country. Um, and they do advocacy like at the state level and national level. So even though it's community-based, it's been a nice mix of different levels and types of uh, work. So. That has been my uh, practicum experience, and I will pass it to, I guess, Annie next. Um, yeah, I have some slides, so I, I can share those. Um, 
Okay, I can see everyone. Um, so I am part of the Baltimore Action Projects cohort for Source. Um, and this term or this year, I've worked with um, Strength to Love Two, which is an urban farm. It's uh, actually an organization, like a group nested under this greater nonprofit called Intersection of Change. Um, they're based in West Baltimore in the Sandtown Winchester uh, area near Upton. Um, and they focused on like community development. Um, but this Strength to Love 2 arm is specifically about like farm and food security and stuff like that. So um, just for context, we, this is where Bloomberg is. And then on the, on the corner of Monroe and Fulton, or in between Monroe and Fulton is the Strength to Love 2 farm. Um, and like I said, it's in Sandtown. Um, which is this like neighborhood right here. Um, and Sandtown is actually a really interesting neighborhood. It's like historically um, the like, what they call like Baltimore's like Harlem. It used to be this like very vibrant, um, like cultural center, um, especially for black Americans in Baltimore. Um, but unfortunately I think due to a lot of like racist redlining policies and um, lack of investment in the community. It's kind of one of the poster childs of uh, like a blighted neighborhood. Um, it's majority black, uh, one third, and there are a few like statistics that I kind of pulled to kind of demonstrate like how much lack of investment has affected this community. So a third of the housing is abandoned. Um, which is characteristic of Baltimore, but this kind of outpaces a lot of other neighborhoods, even in West Baltimore. Um, a third of the residents are below the poverty line and 3% of residents are incarcerated. So there's like a clear need, I think, for intervention in terms of like poverty-based issues and then community revitalization. And then for Strength to Love 2, their focus is food insecurity and specifically, they call it food apartheid because they want to highlight the specifically like political structures that have created this unequal food access, not just food inequality or insecurity, but that it's specifically tied to the history of this community. Um, and so, yeah, so this is where it is. And so if you like kind of zoom in, they have this block of um, the city, which they have like quite a few hoop houses. So these are like little greenhouses kind of where they plant like rows of fresh produce um, and this is what they look like inside they're pretty big and they're very fun to be in they're very warm um, but the the uh, big like uh, push and mission of the Stoll 2 farm is to transform these like vacant lots into productive land and then feed their local community members and the greater Baltimore city um, with fresh produce. Um, and so they sell to local restaurants. I know Source gets like a box and stuff and um, other institutions. And what is interesting about them, I think, is that they employ formerly incarcerated community members to work the farm. So it's kind of this like triple good that they're doing um, with on, on the property. Um, and so I got like a kind of overview of their produce, they sold over 500 pounds of produce in 2021. So they felt like they could expand to putting in, putting all this together into like a formal market. And so at the end of 2021, they opened a farm stand where they just sold produce, I think um, every other week on their property, um, just them though, um, to kind of see how it would go. And it went pretty well. So they this year wanted to expand to like inviting other vendors and community members and maybe like health um, related organizations to create this like community project of where this could be like a hub for growth and for meeting and stuff like that in Sandtown. And so that was kind of the uh, like structure of the project that was um, given to me. It was like intentionally, I think very open for interpretation and so I've it's kind of out of my comfort zone because I think I um like I am my bigger strength is like to complete things that are very specific but I think with this I got a lot of creativity which I really enjoyed and of course like the team at Intersection of Change and 
as well too, like has taught me a lot about Baltimore and working with like community-based organizations and how difficult but rewarding that can be. So this is where we are now. I will not lie. I, I think we've been set back quite a lot. Um, we originally planned to launch this market with like, you know, hopefully like 10 or 20 vendors in early April. But um, what I've learned is that Baltimore City is very slow to approve things. So um, that only got done recently. And then we also recently secured like entertainment for the first market and like put together all the logistics for like setup when the first market happens, which we push back to the end of May. Um, right now, I think what we're struggling a lot with is like to get community buy-in that this is like a viable place to sell and so we're working with uh, another organization called the black mall and that spotlights like by pop businesses at this like a uh, monthly event where the, at different places i believe where they have like i think over a hundred vendors um from around baltimore so hopefully with this partnership we can kind of like combined together and like launch it well. And then the other thing that we're working on right now is like marketing to the community, both directly and through partnership with um, like civic leaders and also the, the Afro, the newspaper that runs out of Baltimore and DC. So that is where we are now. But yeah, my role is basically just to like coordinate, I think the rest of the team and keep us on track and stuff. But yeah, it's been fun. That's it. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, I see Jack has joined us. So Jack, if you're ready, you are our last speaker to go ahead and present um, your work with us whenever you're ready. Sure, yes, um, I am ready now. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for kind of having, having us here to talk about our work. Um, I hope that it's informational for folks, um, that they learn something or that they find a community organization that they're interested in volunteering with um or working with in the future um because there's so much uh opportunity i think around us um so my name is jack o'hara i'm in the full-time mph program i'm graduating in may which i'm uh, fairly excited about um and my uh work with source started back in second term um so i applied for and was accepted to a position through the baltimore community practicum um opportunity with source um i I think from start to finish, you know, I was looking to do community based work coming to Hopkins and I actually think that the source office was one of the things that tipped tipped me in favor of pursuing my MPH. Um, just because it's so important, I think, for my education, my professional development, who I want to be and what I want to do with my life. Um, so I found this opportunity, um, I applied and was accepted to work on. Um, a an evaluation of programming at um at house of ruth maryland oh i see your comment mindy yes i'm a big source fan i'm a source believer um i think it's the source of a lot of good in baltimore don't worry the dad jokes will keep coming um okay so yeah so i um house of ruth maryland they're an incredible organization um they provide like probably most most importantly um emergency shelter long-term housing for survivors of intimate partner violence kind of in the immediate or acute setting and then they also provide service coordination which helps people they're kind of like case managers or social workers they essentially help people access resources um such as permanent housing uh, snap WIC, medical services legal services um for any survivor of intimate partner violence in the Baltimore area. Um, this organization really interested me as well because they also have um, one of their uh, centers is in Highland Town and they call it Casa de Ruth. So they also service the growing Latinx population in Baltimore. Um, and they just sounded like they did really good work. So I interviewed with them, I got accepted um, and we did two terms of, of pretty good work. Um, so the main focus of my project was to evaluate how the service coordination program uh, was functioning at House of Ruth, Maryland. Um, what I discovered is that uh, a lot of NGOs apparently, and House of Ruth, Maryland especially, um, they had created programs, but they hadn't necessarily really defined the structure explicitly. 
Um, you know, they didn't have some of the paperwork, which might not seem that important, but it's really, really important as they want to keep expanding their organization and helping more people. And they also wanna make sure that there's a consistency with their programming um, so they can evaluate how is the result of the service coordination program, right? So those people who are connecting and meeting with clients, um, uh, survivors to help them get services. So I came onto the project um, and worked really well with Janice Miller and uh, Florencia Cariso, um, both who manage the service coordination program. Um, I began by doing key informant interviews uh, where I just chatted with folks um, in different departments at House of Ruth, Maryland. And I think through that process, I was really struck by how trauma-informed the organization was oriented. They really, really wanted to empower survivors and um, something that became really key to the service coordination program was removing barriers to survivor identified goals. Um, so this is something we talked about a lot, especially the three of us, um, me and my two preceptors, was really having a fundamental um, theory of change for the service coordination program and something in text that really encapsulated what they wanted to do with survivors in the collaborations that they had. Um, so, um, so I performed my key informant interviews. Um, and after that, I met with Florencia and Janice and we developed a logic model uh, for people who don't, uh, haven't studied program evaluation or anything. Um, logic models are pretty ubiquitous in a lot of different contexts and fields, but essentially it described from start to finish how the program was supposed to function. So all the resources needed, including personnel to execute the service coordination program. Um, then the activities that they were supposed to be doing, um, the general outputs, and then the long and short-term outcomes. So it was a really long process of working both with Janice and Florencia and talking with other people at the organization, um, interviewing some uh, at least one service coordinator to nail down exactly how the program was supposed to function. Um, and so that was honestly the bulk of my work. You know, one thing I learned throughout this process was that things in things of this nature can go slowly. Um, and I think it was good to take long periods of time to really talk about what the program is supposed to do and how it is supposed to um, empower survivors. Um, so that was the focus of the project. I also went on to create graphics to explain the project. So explain um, things, uh, the logic model and theory of change. So that way they could use that to train new service coordinators because I, I should mention this, part of a process evaluation, which is really what I was doing, I was evaluating the process of the service coordination, is to then interview um, the people, the personnel involved in the process. So interview all of the service coordinators and kind of test them against this logic model we had made to see how much they were actually executing the work. Um, and I think like three or four months into the project, all the service coordinators resigned. I mean, there was only... I think two or three of them, but they all resigned in one week. So from there, I talked with Florencia and Janice and said, well, you know, I wanna keep doing stuff, what can I do? So we just came up with some uh, different ideas. So I created a whole list of indicators that they could use in the future um, to create a quality assurance plan for the service coordination program. I learned how to use Canva for the first time in my life and created different graphics so they can train future service coordination, uh, service coordinators. Um, and um, and yeah, and then I just worked on reports for them so that way they could further explain to the entire organization kind of what we had did and where we had gone. So the, the, the project really ended with the idea of creating a quality assurance plan for the service coordination program. Um, so I, I was pretty happy with the work. Um, I think it's really important to work in these kind of programmatic things if it's going to be for a short period of time because it's much more sustainable for me to do that work right rather than be working with any of the clientele where I'm not going to necessarily be there for a long time. And especially since I don't have plans to stay in Baltimore, the idea of kind of inserting myself into the community and then uh, leaving for me uh, definitely didn't, didn't seem like a good way. So I, I, I thought that this project was really a, um, a good path for me and I really, really enjoyed it. So uh, thank you so much.
Back. I'll just chime in here real quick because, again, you were in the course that I teach, and because I have this information, um, I also think it's really important to note that the team at House of Ruth just raved about the work that Jack did in supporting their work and the collaboration. So it was definitely a mutually beneficial experience of um, that collaboration and the work that you've done to support um, the service coordinators and the organization moving forward, even having a logic model that can be used for so many different purposes. So I commend you on that, but you know, I want everybody to know um, the organizations really value these partnerships with our students. So to all of you, congratulations. Um, but I do know because Jack's officially wrapped up, um, lots of great feedback on your efforts, well done. Yes, thank you everyone. Wonderful to hear about all the work you've been doing. Um, so now we're gonna transition into the Q&A portion. Um, for our audience members, feel free to either you know use the raise hand function on Zoom um, or pop a question in the chat and I can read it out for you if you're unable to access your audio. Um, just to start with a general question, Jack kind of touched on this, but um, how did um, the service learning component or working with community organizations in general sort of play into your motivations for the MPH or enrich your MPH studies on top of all the coursework and all the other requirements for the program. And that's for everyone. So whoever wants to jump in. Um, I can answer that. Um, so I think um, coming into the MPH, I knew I wanted to prioritize uh, like community-based work as opposed to a lot of the academic stuff that we do that's required for school. And I think I was really grateful to have a source because when you come to a new city and like a new like system, you have no idea like who the players are, I guess. And like, I come from San Francisco, so I, I know like what the different agencies are and what the relationships are between them. But when you get to Baltimore, you don't really know like what even exists. So it was important to me. I think that I like found that connection early and then like source kind of like just really put that together, but it like really aligns, I think, with my greater goals of like staying in the nonprofit and community based space and um, just like learning about new environments and like taking lessons from Baltimore, which I think is like a very unique, but it has a lot of it's it kind of like has the extremes of like a lot of issues that we um, want to address in other settings. So I think um, like it's been really helpful to me in terms of like what I expected and then also taught me things that I didn't know, like things about the city, which I really enjoyed. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to jump in or similar thoughts? Yeah, sure. I'll... Oh, Harry, did you want to go? I saw you unmute. Okay. You can go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I uh, part of the reason I picked coming to Hopkins was based on source, um, which Professor Junior West and Mindy know well. Um, but yeah, that was part of the driving motivation for me deciding where to go for an MPH. Um, and what I have found, I guess, since undergrad and then when I moved up to Boston thereafter for several years um, is really getting involved with community based organizations has helped me feel like I, you know, am working to become a member of that community and also to better understand what the community needs are, where I can play a role as a community member. Um, I am planning to stay in Baltimore after graduation. So I you know, wanted to sort of get to know the Baltimore community better. And I feel like being with the Y has been really helpful in that, just in building relationships, honestly, with the Y staff, but then also with community members who we've gotten to know. I have found a few basketball fans in those community members, which is exciting. Um, unfortunately, they are rooting for the wrong team, in my opinion, but I will not digress. Um, so anyways, it's just been really helpful to get to know them. And just in terms of how this sort of links back to the MPH, I suppose. So outside of just my interest in, you know, being an active community member, um, I'm also very interested in, you know, the social determinants of health space and health related social needs. And a lot of the work that I was doing prior to coming to get an MPH um, was really focusing on how to identify uh, health related social needs like food insecurity or housing instability or a lack of access to transportation. Um, and then through this experience, you know, and then sorry, through the identification of those and then finding ways to address them too. So not just identifying them, but then what can we do to help connect people with various resources that will actually help address those needs. Um, 
And so I think through this, it just, it gave me a new appreciation for alternate ways to look at how we can help address food needs. Um, Cause previously I really only thought about it from the aspect of providing people with, you know, options for fr free fresh produce or, you know, food pantry items. Um, but this really gave me a new appreciation for it's not just about giving people access to those foods, but then what do they do with them once they have them? Um, and so I think that that's something really important that quite frankly, I just had never thought past getting them access to the foods. But then even if we get them access, if people don't know what to do with those items, which again, having seen the food pantry bags many weeks, I know I've kind of looked at them and had to sit there for a while thinking about what we could make. Um, and so I think by providing these recipe books, that's something that people may feel um, like they now have the information or the resources they need to not only get access to these foods, but then know what to do with them when they get home um, and how they can maybe, you know, feed themselves or feed their families or even maybe share some of the recipes with community members, um, which is something we've certainly encouraged many of them to do with the various recipes. Um, so I just think that's a different part of it I hadn't considered and kind of going past just identifying needs and addressing them at sort of the access level, but then what to do past just getting people access. Thank you. And then Harry, um, did you want to add something as well? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I guess I the practicum was a big part of why I came here. I mean, I think it was a combination of, well, it's a combination of the research part, the capstone and the practicum. I think having to do both of those was something I liked that you had to both show that you kind of like were very academically rigorous and learned all the methods. And you also had to show that you like had an intent and a desire to put them into practice and understood the like vast kind of difference between those two aspects of public health. Um, so those I think kind of in combination with things that I really liked and then getting to actually be involved with a community organization, um, but really just like public health practice in general which is not something I've ever really done before. Um, I thought it was a really great experience. I think it was really interesting to see how much like even local organizations use like data and do program evaluation and do research to like build their cases. I think very cool to see the transferability of skills between like the practicum and the capstone uh, and to get a sense that like there is absolutely space within research for people that have a lot of experience in public health practice. And there's a lot of space within public health practice for people who are really good at the research aspect. Um, and I didn't, mine weren't linked directly, but they're both like sort of in similar topics. So I really liked getting the opportunity to kind of have a little bit of um, transferability between the two. I don't know if that exactly answered the question, but yeah. <laughs> Still wonderful to hear regardless. So thank you very much for that. Um, another question, um, just broadly again, what is the biggest like challenge that you've had working with the community and the biggest, I guess, not facilitator, but the biggest, I guess, positive, um, especially knowing the context of like Hopkins as an institution within Baltimore? Well, I'll just say that I didn't work directly with the community as much. I was more involved with sort of internal workings of the organization, um, but just sort of from like what I, you know, even within that and what I gathered from things that were like holding up aspects of the uh, program or the organization's like goals and programs, I'd say like the biggest impediments were really never community uh, like impediments or the people that were trying to be like involved was really more like governmental institutions and like policies that were really like the holdup, like getting policies changed to be allowed to go into prisons to do various programs or like working with prisons themselves or like even just working with like big universities to try to get them to implement like college and prison programs. Uh, those are really the problem, like the things that often held up. It was never really the people that were going to be getting the education that were sort of like delaying things it was never people that were going to be providing the education specifically that were delaying things it was really like the big like institutional factors that were the biggest kind of roadblocks to the organization's goals um for me i think because my role was so 
broad, I ended up taking the lead on a couple of things, but to come in as like a person who's unfamiliar with like the, the, the system of other organizations and then also someone who like doesn't have an organizational email, I think was like an interesting uh, difficulty for me because I couldn't, if I emailed from the, from the Hopkins email to like network with other organizations, I literally never got a response back. But um, if someone from Intersection of Change or from Strength to Love 2 like emailed from their organizational email and they recognize names and you know they had met before maybe at like a farm event or something like that like that was much more successful and so I think I've had I've struggled a lot with like not having the authority to like get the partnerships and make the decisions that I would want to on behalf of the market so all of my like kind of ideas kind of have to get filtered through the organization which really delays the process and then also um, puts a lot of work on our program director who is already like pretty burdened by running the farm and his team um, in addition to like trying to undertake this huge project which was the whole reason why they like maybe tried to get a source intern in the first place but um, yeah so that was really tough for me I think is like the relationship of Hopkins and West Baltimore is still like not the rest of Baltimore is still not great and um, like to come in as like an intern for one year uh, makes it hard to like understand the community space and then also like have the appropriate networking like background to make connections with organizations that you want to. Thanks so much. Um, I see we have a question from Marie in the chat. This also relates to a question that I had. Um, so she asked, um, what do you perceive as the biggest challenge um, to the sustainability of what you have done and hope endures? Um, and that relates to my question was thinking like, what are you leaving and what are you like bringing with you in terms of your work this year? Yeah, so I can chime in. We've had this conversation many times over the past several months, honestly, kind of since we started of just being keenly aware of the fact that at some point, you know, the two of us who are there are both in the MPH program. Um, and although we'll both be sticking around, she's actually going back over to the Hopkins Med School, you know, so I, I think there's potential for us to continue to support them, but likely not in the same capacity, partly because one of the shifts is right in the middle of like a work day or when, you know, people might be in clinic, um, which I think creates some challenges there just because it's in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so one of the challenges that we've encountered, um, which I, you know, I, I don't imagine is necessarily unique to this project, but the two women who are really spearheading this work sort of at the higher level in the uh, Y of Central Maryland both ended up switching positions and they were really the advocates for this work and really the sort of like go-getters in terms of, you know, bringing this idea, you know, to reality um, and trying to really get the tastings and demonstrations off the ground. And so that co certainly caused a few hiccups at the beginning because they sort of shifted roles right as we were about to launch our tastings and demonstrations. Um, and then I think in terms of continuing that the challenge has been with some of the staff turnover. So one, losing our two biggest advocates and two, there's been some staff turnover at the local Y as well um, that, you know, other staff members have kind of taken on the responsibility of like coordinating with us when we're there um, during our cooking, you know, uh, experiences. And so I think that it's it's kind of been added work for staff members. It's not like there's so, someone dedicated to sort of helping with this effort. Um, so what we've been talking about with them is trying to, again, work with them to identify volunteers, given that they have a really strong volunteer base. Um, I think that that would, you know, be something really awesome to continue on, you know, whether that's the other, you know, student that I'm with, whether or not we volunteer on occasion, um, or some of their other, you know, food bank um, volunteers, I think, could help take this on. But the way we're hoping to help with the transition as well, aside for just identifying individuals, is also basically putting together sort of an entire report of like, if you've never done this before, here's what you would need to do. So not just giving them access to our recipes, which they already have because we made them a, a recipe book that we leave there. Um, and they actually have the supplies already there, um, but really just 
you know, giving them ideas for like, hey, if on this random day you don't end up getting foods that you were planning to use for this recipe, here are some ideas for things you can make sort of right off the bat. Or, oh, if you don't have this kitchen, you know, utensil, here are other ways you can go about doing this. Because that's something like we didn't have a peeler one time when I needed to peel potatoes. They don't have a pasta strainer. So we've like gotten creative at times of how to figure out, you know, what we can do with the resources we have. Um, so giving them suggestions for like, if you're missing this, try to use this, or if you don't have this, try to use that. Um, and giving them just guidance as to like, you know, challenges we encountered. And then also to your point of sort of like facilitators that made cooking easier sometimes, what were those um, and how can they sort of pick those up and run with it? Um, so we are, you know, basically giving them an entire implementation guide um, that sort of allows them to start for that. And then also making some flyers for them that they can use to just sort of advertise the food pantry more because they're actually hoping, I think right now they have like 120 to 150 food pantry recipients a week or something, but they're trying to increase that number a bit more. Um, and then just coming up with other creative ways to get the tastings and foods to community members. Um, Cause fortunately they partner with a lot of um, like churches, for example, who end up delivering the bags of food, which means that some of the recipients don't actually get to taste our foods. It's other community members who aren't benefiting from the food pantry. That has been one of our challenges. Um, so figuring out, you know, could they send them little like tasting cups, for example, um, or little to-go boxes, which we have done a few times with, um, with bowls, getting creative and like making bowls into a to-go box with a rubber band. Um, but I think just figuring out how to be creative on the spot and so giving them some of those suggestions and ideas um, in the form of this report. And then again, we, you know, certainly at least I, you know, would be happy to like go back and help, you know, cook a few times with someone if we're, you know, when we're transitioning it, but that's been something we've been trying to work on for months and have just really struggled with identifying people who can sort of take it on indefinitely. Um, Thank you, Lauren. I think really well said. Um, yeah, I think, you know, this is a really interesting question. Um, I think any community-based work in the long term, if you're not obviously starting, like starting a job there and doing your whole career there, there's always going to be these questions of sustainability, right? Um, and for my project, um, it was, like I said, fairly far removed. It was the creation of foundational documentation for the program. So from my perspective, initially, when I started it, I was like, wow, this is very, this is going to be very sustainable, right? Because I do this, I leave them with this, with information. And then I continue on, you know, with maybe whatever else I was doing. But as I was doing the process of the project, creating this logic model and, and thinking about program recommendations, I realized that I needed to be incredibly clear about how I came up with everything. So I think for me, the sustainability of my project and something that became a huge focus was to lay out and write guides for everything that I created. Um, so I tried to clearly explain, kind of distill and make it palatable any of the information I learned from my Fundamentals of Program Evaluation course. Um, and so pretty much when I made my logic model, when I made uh, indicators for every single aspect of the logic model, and when I did a rapid literature review, I included exactly how I did all of those things. And I met with my preceptors to say, hey, this is how I did this. So as you're looking at this documentation, I'm thinking about how to modify your programming. Maybe you can redo this. You know, if you're looking for new information or new recommendations, new literature on what kind of programs are best for survivors of intimate partner violence, you could search with these kind of search tools. Um, so I think that enhanced the sustainability of my work. There's, and, and I think that there still is places where I definitely, you know, where maybe I could have improved a little bit. Um, and I think with the one year commitment, it's always going to be somewhat unsustainable, is what I learned throughout the process. Um, but I think I hope, I hope what endures is really just, um, you know, I think the, the impetus for the program to have a clear backbone of the logic model of how they're doing their programming, the idea of really monitoring if what they're doing is helping survivors to succeed and achieving their goals. Um, that's what I really hope endures. And I hope a relationship with Hopkins endures because they can always use more more people and it was a really great experience for me.
Thank you so much for you two for that. Um, related question from Sequan, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, what do you think um, the biggest skill you gained or enhanced during your experience working with the community is? Um, so like, what are you taking with you um, on your future endeavors? Um, maybe I can give like a broad answer. I think for me, um, I think it's like project time management um, because when we were back in like September and I was looking forward to, you know, okay, maybe we would start this in April. It felt like we had years of time to plan for this project. Um, and unfortunately, like December, January, February rolls around really quick. And you don't realize that um, the people at special events take like three months to approve your application. And then things just get like pushed back and pushed back. And it really feels like when you, every time you get up to a deadline, it feels like you've lost something, like you're losing potential time to implement the intervention. And also like, I think it's really demoralizing for the team to like see that their efforts haven't been like, um, haven't bore fruit yet. And so we've had to push it back twice now. I think I think this like May 20th thing will actually stick, but it's just like, I think going into future projects, it would be important for me to like establish a timeline from the very beginning. We kind of did that really roughly, but didn't put in specifics until something more like December and January. But if say we had like submitted the application, um, like in October, for example, like the end of the last market season, I think we wouldn't have run into those same problems. And I also think like part of the reason why we submitted the application so late was that it kind of had to like get justified to the director and then the executive director and because there was a fee attached to it. And so I would have really liked to have more meetings in person. I was remote for uh, quite a bit of it. And I think it that really lacked like the, I felt like I could explain much more impassionedly um, about like our prospects for the project if we were in person and maybe like connect and, and like really validate like the work that we had been doing. But I think what the executive director saw was that like things weren't perfect yet. Like we hadn't recruited like 25 vendors and like we're ready on site and whatever. So. I think like that is also something that I would bring is like making sure that everyone is present who is going to make a decision. I think this is in like one of our lectures, but you need to have everyone who's going to have an opinion on the decision present at a meeting um, because otherwise like everyone who's at the meeting might agree, but then it's going to have to take another week or two to get past like the person who was absent. So yeah, those two things I think for me. I think I would say that like the biggest thing that I uh, noticed, I mean, I guess I don't know if it's necessarily something I specifically enhanced as much as just was like very cognizant of is the need in sort of all realms of public health to be able to sort of speak the language and at the level that your audience is like familiar with the topic. So whether that's like higher than you, lower than you, or just different than you, um, whether it's, you know, having to learn language and terminology to engage with people that they know that you didn't know or figure out how to talk about a topic or research or policy with people who don't do that kind of work uh, in a way that is relatable to them. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that's like lacking in public health is like a really good and rigorous and consistent ability to message um, or to have messages for points at a level that is like readily uh, that like the audience you're like speaking to is readily able to interact with um and i think this was just like such a different population that i never worked with before on a topic i've never worked with before in a way i've never worked with before so having to kind of constantly think about the language i'm using and the uh like the way we talk about things and just like really quickly familiarizing myself with 
the different organizations that are involved and the different like forms that exist so that I was able to reference them with the same like familiarity that other organization members were referencing them with was um, really important. And so I think that was just like being very like aware of that as an issue in public health and as something that I think can take like a little, just a little bit of effort into that can go like a very long way. I think um, that gets you a lot of buy-in from people and a lot of like respect and appreciation from people to be able to um, communicate in a way that's like much more um, like interchangeable, I guess. So I think that sort of everything around that was the, what I like gains uh, hands in terms of Uh, yeah, I can share, I guess. I just think being uh, really adaptable and flexible is important. And I think this maybe goes to Annie's point to some degree of like when timelines change or things take longer than you think they're going to take. Um, one, just kind of like remembering that, that that's okay. Um, and that, you know, obviously a lot has been disrupted and changed in the world over the past couple of years. Um, so I guess we should all be sort of well-versed in being flexible and adaptable, um, but I think that's easier said than done. Um, and I just, you know, like starting our cookings uh, got delayed by like two months, again, because of those staff changes. And we had to pause for a little bit when COVID numbers went up again. Um, and so I think, you know, just trying to, you know, just, one, like remaining optimistic about it, but two, being okay with being flexible and adaptable and trying to sort of uh, be creative and maybe come up with new ideas um, for how you can work around those. Um, so like, I think even a, a new idea that I'm, I'm really more thinking of as we're talking about it here, um, but when, you know, COVID numbers were going up, for example, potentially having honestly like made the food and then just putting our table close to the front door where we still could have given community members like the to-go boxes of the food, for example. Um, just as they take the bags of the food pantry foods out to the front door, you know, we could have had a different way to provide food to those community members. Um, Cause there were some community members who specifically, you know, would wait on Tuesdays and Saturdays, you know, or get there early on Saturday mornings to see us and then wait on Tuesdays, you know, to grab a bite to eat. Um, and so I think that was something that, you know, I, I guess I wish I thought about that before right now, um, but is something we can definitely put in a book for, a, you know, in our report for a future idea um, for as this continues, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I think just remembering to try to, you know, be creative and thoughtful about workarounds or alternate options, and maybe it's a, a very different plan than what you initially intended, um, but being okay with coming back to the drawing board and kind of brainstorming, whether it's with yourself or with a group, um, about ways in which you can, you know, respond to those changes um, and still figure out a way that allows you to move forward, um, and especially when it's involving the community that, the, the required changes aren't uh, detrimental or harmful to the community um, or, you know, don't put them at a disadvantage just because you need to be flexible and move things around. Um, I even think about that with the why, like the ultimate goal is for um, community members to actually be able to like shop in the food pantry, which I think is really interesting um, so that they can actually come in and get food items that they need for that week. Um, and even pick out the fresh produce they need because the Y has fresh produce that gets donated as well as part of the food pantry. Um, and so allowing individuals to do that. Well, obviously with COVID, they couldn't allow, you know, like 20 people to cram into the food pantry. I've been in that food pantry. It would be tight with more than a few of us in there at one time. Um, so they certainly couldn't do that, you know, when we had to stand, you know, three to six feet apart. Um, and so that's where they ended up, you know, doing these to-go bags and then even, you know, taking them out to the front door area. Um, and so figuring out just ways to transition where you can still, you know, um, help, you know, benefit the community or provide whatever service you promise to provide, but just finding maybe a new way to do that. Um, so just kind of always remembering that we need to be flexible and adaptable, and especially in a field like public health where things change often um, and where maybe people want to listen to public health one day and then don't want to listen as much the next day, for example. Like we just need to be okay with making changes. Thank you so much. I'm going to be ambitious and ask one more question um, before we close out. Um, this came from Laura in the chat. Um, how does your experience working with community organizations this year fit into your 
future education and career goals as you approach graduation and leaving Hopkins, and for some of you leaving Baltimore as well. Um, I kind of mentioned this before, but I think uh, this is my first introduction to kind of like doing program management and planning. And that's what I'm hoping to do in the future. So before the MPHA, I worked in San Francisco as a case manager. And so I'm planning to return back to California and do like similar work, but in a more like man management administrative kind of role. So I think this has taught me a lot. Like this is my probably my primary experience in like program planning and stuff like that. And I think it'll be easier with an organization that I'm familiar with, but um, a lot of the same issues still exist in terms of getting funding and the permits and setting up and materials and logistics and stuff like that. So I feel like this fits in pretty well, even though it may not necessarily be like my field per se like I don't I don't work in food insecurity like for my career but I think a lot of the lessons are very transposable so for me it, it's it's like it fits in well I think I can um I can make a quick comment because I think I'm, I might be in a different camp than other folks I don't really plan to necessarily go directly into doing program evaluation for organizations. Um, I think this experience informed how I want to work and what communities I want to work with. Um, afterwards, I'm planning on going to do uh, medical school. So I really do want to be a clinician that can live in and be with uh, people in the community who just aren't getting the kind of service that everyone really should have a right to. Um, so I don't know exactly what the future holds, but I do know that this experience and other opportunities to volunteer through Source have just continuously reinforced that this is the kind of stuff that I, I want to do. It's that I think it's the stuff that just I think is the most valuable right now um, for me. So I would say even if you're uncertain about a project or if a student is, it's always great just to get out there and, and get to work, you know. Yeah, I can just briefly say that it's kind of, I think for me, similar to Jack, like I'm not sure that this like prison education is not necessarily like where my career is going. Like I'm taking this year off from med school for the MPH. So, you know, going back and finishing that and doing a residency, everything is where my career is sort of like immediately going, but working with uh, disadvantaged communities, working to like correct health disparities um, are aspects like I want to be big parts fed. Like that's the type of research I'm interested in. And I think just any work you get helping, I mean, I think no matter whether you do it in your career or not, just any work you do to help people that need it is worthwhile, but also just like the skills that you get from it and the experiences uh, play a big role, I think, in like shaping you and shaping your perspective when you then are in other spaces where that maybe wasn't like front and center um, or even just like in conversation. So I think all of that is very, um, like important and it's kind of a little intangible, like it's a little hard to quantify exactly how that's helping as in the sense of just generally making you and your work better, I think, but yeah. Oh, Lauren, do you wanna go quickly? No, I was just going to say everyone summed it up very well. I'm also okay. being mindful of time and, and don't want to hold people over. I know that capstones and practicum requirements are awaiting, um, but I did just want to say thank you to everyone for joining and that also I, I thought Jack and Annie and Harry summed up everything today very well. And oh, yes, I'm sorry, Saquon, birthdays, you got to celebrate yours. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, again, echoing that. Thank you guys so much for coming. This was a great session, learned a lot from it. Um, Mindy posted up in the chat, um, be sure to check out the rest of the events as part of National Volunteer Review Source. A um, bunch more in-person, or there's one in-person volunteering session Mindy talked about at the beginning, if you missed that. Um, and then also some virtual sessions, all the information is on their website. Definitely looking forward to those. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, go forth with all your practicum and capstone 
lovely deliverables and everything. Um, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you all.